Welcome everyone. You're joining us for Measuring the Power and Beam Profile of Divergent Laser Sources. This webinar is presented by Ophir, which is part of MKS Instruments and hosted by Photonics Media. I'm Sarah Weiler and I'm the webinar coordinator at Photonics Media. You're going to be hearing today from Dr. Derek Peterman, Sales Director for the Americas at Ophir. He has worked with laser engineers and scientists on laser beam profiling applications for over 20 years. In this discussion, he's going to be going over some methods for reliably characterizing the beam power and profile of divergent sources to help better understand a laser's performance. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, please try logging out and logging back in to fix it. But if that doesn't work, don't worry, the session is being recorded. It will be online within a couple of days and you're going to get links to that in your email inbox so you won't have to look for it. There's going to be a Q&A at the end of today's presentation, but you can ask a question or leave a comment at any time in the chat on your screen. And if we don't get to you today, we will reply later by email. So that's all from me. I'd like to welcome Dr. Derek Peterman. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, as you can see, I've created a home office in my uh, son's room. You can see all the Legos that he built. And you see he's a uh, Buckeye, Ohio State Buckeye sports fan. So I um, uh, hope that does not offend uh, anyone from the Big Ten from any uh, rival school. But anyway, let me go ahead and start my presentation. Okay, so I'm going to begin with talking about the uh, measuring the power and the beam profile of divergent um, laser sources. So just to give you a kind of an outline of what I'm going to talk about, um, first I'm going to, you know, what, what are we measuring? What are divergent sources and, and, and why would anyone want to measure them? And then I'll go into why they are challenging to measure. Um, they these particular sources create a number, because they're very divergent, create some challenges um, in the way uh, that you, that don't exist when you're measuring collimated sources. So um, give you some, some uh, flavor of why, why these particular lasers are, are difficult to measure. Um, but, there, but there is hope, um, they can be measured. So I'm gonna discuss effective ways to measure the power of divergent lasers um, and effective ways to measure the beam profile of divergent lasers. So I'll go into those techniques and uh, how, what kind of results we can get from, expect to get from those. I'd also like to thank my Ophir colleagues, uh, Mark Sletsky, Effie Rotem, and Simon Rankel. Um, all three of them provided some very uh, good information and material that I'm using today um, to put this talk together. So, I guess the first thing is, when is a beam considered divergent? Um, I guess that's a bit of a subject, um, you know, subjective um, de definition, but what I'll get into is typically when the size of the beam, the half angle divergence becomes 10 degrees or larger, that's when you need to begin to concern yourself with a divergence and, and how that's going to affect the results. Um, what, what happens is you start to see angular effects in, in the test equipment to measure beam divergence or, or power, I'm sorry, um, to measure power or profile, and that becomes significant um, and that you need to use techniques to somehow circumvent those angular um, angular effects that occur roughly with a half angle being about 10 degrees. Um, and as I say, you know, measuring collimated beam, measuring a collimated beam is easy. The divergent, it's the divergent ones that are hard. And uh, the reason why people want to measure divergent lasers is they're pretty much everywhere. Um, they're very critical in a lot of data and telecom applications, uh, consumer electronics, you have lasers um, in your phones that allow you to do facial recognition or are used in other um, sort of um, various uh, secret sauces of these phones to make, uh, to take nice pictures and to identify your face and do all the neat things that these phones do. Um, 
There's LiDAR, which is, you know, kind of big for self-driving cars and autonomous vehicles. Um, they often use divergent sources and just, um, you know, throughout the, you know, in, in, in way, maybe a little bit more mature markets, there's always been high power laser diodes, optical fibers, fiber optic components that have, um, that create divergent beams and they they all they all have their unique challenges of measurements and and just to give you an idea of how um, ubiquitous divergent lasers are I mean we wouldn't be having this conversation if it weren't for divergent lasers I mean so so that's um, it, it's they're they're really kind of all around us and so um, you know measure measuring them and understanding them is important. And so what do people want to know about these lasers? Um, you know, are they generating the right power? Uh, you know, t enough power to do the job and uh, maybe not too much power. Um, you can think of that gentleman with a cell phone uh, doing facial recognition. Uh, you obviously want to have some power in order to, um, to scan the person's face, but uh, to, to too high of power laser, and you're uh, you create a, um, a potential blinding situation. Um, how does the power depend on the drive current of the laser? Um, what is the beam divergence, and what what optics work best with that beam divergence to be, do useful work? And a very common application is optical coupling of divergent fibers. So um, if you're coupling a 10 micron core single mode fiber to a divergent laser um, where the beam is expanding very quickly uh, the divergence angles for um, laser diodes that couple the optical fibers can be as large as 40 50 degrees you want to use the right optics to get that widely expanding fast expanding beam into a very small micro a very small core um, optical uh, fiber core um, does multi-mode laser behavior occur at certain drive currents? Um, are defects affecting the beam quality? And I could go on and on. There's there's lots of questions that that um, you know the people in the industry are trying to answer and trying to understand with these laser sources. And so, um, in order to understand the lasers, you know, we need good ways to measure them. So the two main challenges of measuring a divergent the power of a divergent beams is well, they're divergent, so the beams get very large over short distances, and so they require a large area sensor. Um, the sense, you know, so so that's one challenge. It's simply getting a large enough sensor. The other challenge is if we could get a large enough sensor, um, the sensor would would have a strong angular response, um, and this is particularly true for photodiodes um, for low power measurements. Um, on the right, you can see a graph of typical, I think this is silicon. Um, I think it's a couple different types of silicon, but um, material is not, not, so, not so critical. This is typical of photo, photodiodes. Um, you can see if, if the divergent angle is 30 degrees, um, the, the relative reading is, is reading 70%, is reading 30% lower and even 40 degrees, which is not unusual in divergent lasers you're almost down at half the responsivity with this with one particular material. So what you can see is that if you simply stick a divergent laser source up to a photodiode sensor and turn it on, the you know the areas in the middle of the beam which are moving are hitting the sensor at pretty much um, a zero degree angle, they'll they'll the they'll get the full photo detector response. But as you go towards the edge, the beam, the, the response of the photodiode will become weaker and weaker as the angle gets larger. So what will happen is that you can, you can very seriously undermeasure the output power of the laser um, due to this uh, angular effect of photodiodes. So you can't, so in many cases, you, you simply just can't stick these lasers up to a typical photodiode sensor and get a reading because the reading just is, is going to be affected by the angle. So how do we get around that? Well, we use something uh, called an integrating sphere. And the way the integrating sphere works is you have a 
you have a sphere which inside it has some very reflective diffusive material and as the beam comes in it bounces and then it bounces again on the surface and um, it keeps bouncing around and finally as it keeps going through multiple reflections um, it will eventually sort of uniformly create sort of a shroud if you will of light that kind of coats the entire integrating sphere as all that light's kind of bouncing around inside and so what you can do is you can put a detector at one edge of the integrating sphere and you can then look at a, basically a piece of that light and from doing from calibrating cali doing calibration with a known source you can actually determine the total power of the input beam and so that's usually how it's done is usually some sort of cali using a reference standard um to to calibrate the calibrate the signal from the detector um, in order to determine um, the overall uh, power of an input beam of that uh, into the sphere. Um, one thing to keep in mind is changes in the size of the import beam will change the calibration. So uh, that's something to, um, to consider um, depending if you, if, you know, for example, if you enlarge the enlarge the input port, you'll need to then recalibrate uh, the integrating sphere. Uh, another thing I'll mention is, and this is kind of a large, can be a big topic in, Excel, in itself, laser pulse energy can also be captured if the detector and the data acquisition electronics support the pulse frequency rate. So that's that gets into a lot of the electronics of the situation, which I won't go into very deeply, but um, you can also, in addition to measuring power, measure the laser pulse energy. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is um, integrating spheres have baffles in them. You can see that on the left, if the beam is coming in from the laser diode, there is certain certain light from that laser diode will hit the sphere directly without any multiple reflections. And so, a baffle is put into the sphere to prevent that from happening. So the be so that creates the situation where the beam is is multiply reflected around uh, the sphere until it eventually gets to the detector. Um, and you can see that for a collimated beam, the the baffle has to be put in a different position to uh, pre prevent that. So that's something to keep in mind with integrating spheres. You want to make sure that you use a baffle that's uh, configured. Um, in the case of a, of a divergent beam uh, in the configuration on the left to prevent um, erroneous results uh, that are caused by the beam by um, you're sort of short circuiting this multiple reflection effect. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, the, um, integrating sphere vendors will, will specify whether the sphere is for collimated or divergent beam, and that usually the only usually the difference is simply the the location of the baffle. So just to give you an example of how these spheres are typically used, and also why uh, integrating spheres are very sort of handy and, and, and fairly ubiquitous piece of lab equipment. Um, this is just a little sample setup. Um, there's a there's a Vixel on the bottom. It's on a, a little uh, a little breadboard. Normally, the normally the input source would be much closer to the port than than shown here. But it's um, uh, but this is just kind of for the example. Um, there's a power measurement readout which is con which is connected to the power sensor that will tell that will indicate the um, output the the power level of the source. Um, there's a fast photodiode here on a on a separate port that's used to look at the temporal pulse shape of the Vixel. And in this particular example, the North Pole port is closed. Um, however, you could, um, you could add a tap there that would tap out some of the light which you could send to say a spectrometer if you wanted to look at the spectrum of the laser or if there's some other characteristics that you wanted to look at, um, you, could, you, could, you could tap out a little piece of that beam uh, 
and analyze it. So uh, integrating spheres are, are actually fairly handy because you can, because of the nature of the way they work, they allow you to do multiple tests uh, in a single test station. Um, just to give you an idea of typical materials, uh, they have to be very reflective, uh, greater than 95% reflectance, uh, very diffusive to sort of uh, further scatter the light around the sphere. Um, typical materials, and this is fairly common, Teflon, it's, um, it's a material uh, kind of typically known as PTFE. Um, you can use white paint, it's just um, usually not the preferred way of doing it. Um, it has been done um, for in, for um, IR. The uh, the material is typically gold, um, coating the coating the um, inside of the sphere with gold, which is a common uh, IR reflector. Uh, we didn't have any pictures we had of integrating sphere materials. weren't too weren't too exciting, so we just thought we'd use this um, picture of the James Webb Space Telescope. It's an IR telescope, and you can see these sort of little gold hexagons there that make up the uh, make up the telescope. So, gold is a common reflective material for infrared, and it's used uh, it's used very commonly in integrating spheres for infrared sources. Now, it is possible um, to as I'm, it is possible to, rather than using an integrating sphere, use a regular thermal detector um, directly and just basically shine the, make sure you capture all the light onto the surface of the detector. Uh, the only thing you need to make sure of is that you have a, an absorbing material that has a, has a low angular dependence. So, that is an option. Um, these detectors typically work at about half a watt to kilowatt powers. Um, and so typically certain things like a very, may not be practical for small vixels that might be putting out a few milliwatts, but if you have a higher power source, it is possible to actually just use a high power thermal detector with a coating that has um, a low angular uh, response. And so this is a couple of examples that, um, that uh, you can see on the graph on the right, uh, this LP2 material has a very low responsivity. Um, so any materials that were similar to that, you could actually use as a thermal detector and get reliable results of, reliable power measurements of a of a divergent source by, by just simply measuring it directly without uh, without using an integrating sphere. So now I'm going to turn to beam profiling, um, and maybe I should just uh, just to review what beam profiling is. We're looking at the spatial distribution of power. So we're looking at the size of the beam, its shape its divergence, its qual and its quality. Those are the, the main things that, uh, that people are trying to extract from a, extract from a laser when they, uh, when they measure the, the, the profile. And you, know, you get these sort of pictures, as you see on the right, sort of a donut, um, donut profile. And there's two main methods of, of profiling. There's scanning apertures where you're moving, you know, using an aperture, moving it around somehow, um, and looking at the light that passes through the aperture, or 2D sensor rays, they're sort of colloquially called cameras, but you're using some sort of sensor that looks at basically taking a snapshot of the beam. And we'll see that both scanning apertures and a 2D sensor array are both used for, can both be used for divergent sources. So I'm going to go a little bit with two types of profiling, near field and far field. Um, and the far field criterion is when you're a distance, um, distance away that's much larger than the size of the beam waste or effectively the size of the laser source divided by squared divided by the wavelength is, in, with, is when you're in the far field. And you can see that you actually, for a lot of these um, divergent sources like a VIXEL where the, beam, the, 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 the dimension of the beam is fairly small, you don't have to be very far away. For say a 10 micron VIXEL, so D being uh, little d being uh, 10 microns, if you square 
um, if you square 10 microns, um, that's 100 microns. And the typical wavelengths are, we'll just, we'll just uh, round up to, you know, usually they're around a micron. So you can only be, if you're 100, if you're 100 microns, if you're, if you're um, more than a, a number greater than 100 microns away from, from um, a voxel, you'll be in the far, uh, you'll be in the far field. So one or two millimeters away from a voxel, if that's where your that's where your um, that's the plane of where you're profiling, you're already in the far field. So you you it's it's very um you know you don't have to be very far away from many of these sources to be in the far field. So um so at, at any rate you know you know so um. Far field profiling is looked at, whereas you're basically where uh, the mode evolution of the beam is, if, is is the same as if it were at infinity, and near field profiling is actually looking at uh, the beam uh, near the at, near the waist at the waist. So I'm going to start with far field profiling, and in this case, you have the same challenges with far field profiling as with power measurement. Um, the beam gets very large over a short distance and often very larger than most sensors. Um, so that, that's, uh, you, you typically cannot just put a standard beam profiler in front of a divergent source. Oftentimes what happens is, is the sensor, which is embedded in that profiler, uh, if the beam travels a few millimeters, the beam is just simply larger, the size of the beam is simply larger than the uh, 2D array sensor inside the profiler, and you can't, you only see a portion of the beam. And um, so that that doesn't work. Um, the other thing is the sensors uh, being photodiode materials themselves, they usually have an angular sense of res responsivity. So the sensors will tend to create effects. Uh, they will tend to under measure the, um, the beam at the edges for the same reason for the same reason we had with uh, power measurement. The um, as the beam angle becomes larger at the edges of the beam, the sensor is less sensitive, and so you tend to um, you tend to that tends to make the beam look narrower than it really is. Um, the, the the final thing is is that uh, these Profilers typically need a, a fair amount of attenuation to prevent from prevent those 2D array uh, detectors from saturating. So this um, this beam attenuation require reduces the also has angular effects and so also will create a narrowing of the beam. So yeah, so th those are those are the, what's those are the challenges that people face. Um, so what to do about that? Well, there's two profiling techniques that are used. Um, there's goniometric scans, which is where a photodiode is rotated about the, uh, the divergent source. And there's also diffuser imaging, where the divergent beam is incident on a diffuser and imaged onto, onto a focal plane array. So I'm going to talk about those two methods. <coughs> then I'm going to take a drink of water before I lose my voice. So let's go with goniometric scans. Um, kind of a simple, simple method. You just simply move a detector around the source, and you use a radius so that you're definitely in the far field. And typically, even a few centimeters is all you need, um, or even a few millimeters if the beam is, if the source is small enough. And so you can you can map out the detector position versus the measured photo-induced current, and you can generate um, you can generate a linear plot of the beam intensity versus angle. Uh, in a few cases, you can actually move the source and keep the detector fixed, but usually the upper upper um, uh, the upper diagram is, is is typically easily easy to easier to implement and, and usually what usually what um, I've, I've encountered most of the time. Um, and so advantages, uh, it's simple and low cost uh, to the photodiode and some goniometric, um, 
you know, some some various uh, goniometric mounts that uh, rotate the beam, rotate the the uh, detector uh, along an arc. Um, it's very direct. Um, it eliminates angular effects. It's you know, it's um, very it's a good it's a good technique for determining beam divergence very directly. Um, you've basically eliminated all the issues that uh, can affect the um, uh, the other beam profiling apparatus angularly. Um, the disadvantage is it's slow. It's often done manually. Um, it generates line scans, not 2D images. So um, one thing that happens is the the results are somewhat non-intuitive. Um, it's hard to visualize the shape of a beam from uh, a, a linear scan. Um, you can do repeated linear scans um, and sort of piece them together, but sometimes it becomes hard to visualize the shape of the beam, hot spots, other features. Um, it, it's a little bit, you could, you could, it's, it's, it's very good for measuring beam divergence, but if you're looking for shape or sort of two dimensional structure, it, it um, you can sometimes, uh, tease that out from repeated linear images, but it's, it's something that, that, it requires some additional effort and, and, and not always obvious from the results. So just give you a, a, an example of a linear scan. This is, this is a typical one on a laser diode. You can see it's a fairly Gaussian beam um, and you can see some structure around, uh, around the middle of the beam, but this is the typical uh, profile you, you, you would get from a, from a linear goniometric scan. Um, the other method that's that's common is a diffuser image method where you use a glass uh, diffuser. Uh, the laser beam is incident on that and then you use a CCTV lens to image the beam um, on the diffuser and then you relay that image onto a profiler and then you profile it. <clears throat> so this particular, um, this particular technique is fast. It captures the entire profile in less than a second. Um, it generates a full two-dimensional image. The results are very intuitive. It's very easy to see. You're, you're basically taking a snapshot of the beam, so it's very easy to, um, you know, to, if you're looking for shape or uh, structural uh, mode structure or some sort of um, uh, variations in the profile, it's very easy to capture that and to observe them. Um, <clears throat> And in addition, you can actually analyze this, uh, those images, images captured by this technique to get measurements like beam size and divergence. Um, the disadvantages, you are, it is a more complicated method. Uh, it involves diffuser materials, imaging lenses. Um, there is some setup involved. You're, you're, you're aligning, you know, you're aligning some optics. Um, you, you know. Yeah, you know, so there's there's there is um, it's a more complicated method um, than say just moving a photo diode around a, uh, a divergent source. Um, so that's the, those are sort of the trade-offs with this technique. Um, we actually uh, at Ophir have a sort of pre-aligned uh, accessory that that uses this particular technique. And just to give you a nice idea of, of the types of results that you can get with a diffuser uh, with a diffuser method, this is a Vixel at different drive currents. And you can see at the lower drive currents, it's actually not, um, apparently isn't lasing yet. It's acting more like an LED. And as we continue to increase the drive current, you can start to see the structure in the beam. Uh, you get sort of this sort of two-peaked effect with this, with this, um, uh, with this particular Vixel. So um, the, the, one, the one nice thing about the diffuser method is you do get very, very sort of uh, pictorially, very, uh, very sort of striking photos that tell you, tell you what's, uh, what's going on with, uh, with your beam. So the other thing I wanna talk about is near field profiling where you're actually imaging this beam right at the source. So these are typically fairly small sources. If you're looking, for example, a Vixel or an optical fiber, um, you, so you can image this with a finite conjugate microscope objective, and then you have various um, neutral density filters to lower the, lower the beam power so that it doesn't saturate the, um, the profiling camera. Um, uh, that actually captures the image. Um, 
For near field profiling, if you're looking at a divergent sources, uh, you must use a, a, the NA of the microscope objective must be greater than the NA of the source to reliably capture the beam. And so the NA, uh, the numerical aperture should, should be equal or greater than the sign of the half angle divergence of, uh, assuming we're in air. Um, so, so you wanna make sure that when you use this technique that you're using a high NA uh, microscope objective lens that has a, a numerical aperture larger than the sign of the, of the half angle divergence. Otherwise, you will not reliably capture the near field profile. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is this typically requires high micron level precision along the optical axis. So you have to, pre you have to fairly precisely position this apparatus um, where the um, the focal plane of the uh, uh, the imaging plane of the microscope objective is is right at the um, right at the um, the output of the laser. If there's any uh, deviation from that, you will you can measure you can the um, uh, the, because you have a, a fairly fast expanding beam, you will you will look at you will be imaging something that's not quite at the near field, and you won't get the true uh, near field uh, profile result. So that's something that uh, you also need to, to be aware of is that this this typically this this type of apparatus typically requires fairly high um, uh, high level precision and uh, stability. So. And this is an example um, on a, a near field profile on a, on a, on a, on a Vixel wafer. Um, you can see the individual Vixels uh, on the left. And as we, when we turn on the uh, turn on the Vixels, you can actually get a profile of, of several Vix of, of all the Vixels uh, on the screen. You can see one in the bottom right hand corner. It looks like uh, you can see there's some sort of uh, scratch on it. You can actually see the scratch visually in the bottom right hand corner um, on the on the left hand image and then you can see how that's affecting things optically on the bottom right hand corner of the uh, of the profile image. So this is one example of where you can uh, you can you can get data that can affect can uh, let you know how how certain things you might see visually on the wafer are affecting the actual uh, beam profile. So uh, I guess I've talked for about a half an hour. Um, I would be hopefully you found hopefully you found that uh, informative, and I look forward to any questions that there might be from the audience. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, yeah, we we have plenty of time to take some questions right now. So if you haven't already, please feel free to type that into the chat. And again, if we don't get to it today for any reason, we will respond later by email. So Derek, thank you very much for presenting. I'm gonna jump in. Uh, so my first question, what is thermal BB? Oh, thermal BB, uh, I think you're talking about this. Uh, are, you, are they asking about, I think they're asking about, let's go back to uh, thermal BB. I think this is referring to a graph where I showed um, uh, a thermal sensor and the angular dependence of the absorption. Uh, thermal BB is a coating that Ophir, um, the, if Ophir uses on our thermal detectors. So it's actually a, um, a material that we that we use for um, for our thermal detectors. And in addition to the LP2 coating that I showed on that graph. All right. Thank you. Um, how much input power? can an integrating sphere handle? Um, that, that depends a few things on the materials of the sphere and the size of the sphere. Um, so there's not a direct answer to that question. Typically you can put, for most spheres, like a six inch sphere, you can put as, in some cases as much as 30 watts into a sphere. Um, in some cases, maybe it's a little less, more like five watts. Um, typical spheres that are sort of in the three to six inch range can usually handle a few, uh, few, at least a few watts. So these actually can handle a fair amount of power. Um, 
But on the other hand, if you have a very high power laser of like hundreds of watts, um, you, you probably will need to attenuate the beam um, to, to really use an integrating sphere. Uh, they, they can, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll begin to damage the coatings inside. What does it mean to calibrate an innovating an integrating sphere? Oh, okay. Let me go into that a little bit more. So, so typically, when you calibrate an integrating sphere, so so when you you, you typically will, you know, the way that the sensor will work is you, you know, if you if you shine a beam and a divergent light laser into the sphere, you know, you'll get some reading. We'll just say, for the sake of argument, you'll get five volts on your uh, on your uh, photodiode. Um, so how, how five volts, you know, how many, <clears throat> for each voltage of response, how does that correlate to the input power of the laser? So what you would typically do is you would take a laser of a known, um, of a known uh, input power, say, say 10 milliwatts. So if you have a laser that you know is 10 milliwatts, and then you get, um, five volts on your photodiode, you know that each volt corresponds to two milliwatts, and then you can calibrate the sphere that way. So that's that's kind of in a nutshell how the sphere is calibrated. You, you look at the response of the detector versus the input of a known input power. And so the important thing is you have to you have to have a laser that you have you know the input power very well. And and you also need to make sure that you're you're you know you have the correct baffles um, uh, in place. Uh, that's not going to affect um, the results where the beam might strike the sensor to directly and without any reflections and cause uh, an error in the measurement. So that's that's the the general idea of how to calibrate a sphere. All right, thank you. Um, what is the laser damage threshold of the coating inside the integrating sphere? Um, it, well, it depends on the coating. Um, I don't know that number offhand. Um, it's probably something on the order of 100 of, I, I I probably shouldn't guess. It's it's typically around uh, it would typically around like a around a watt per square centimeter, something in that neighborhood. It would depend on the material. And uh, to everyone, but for this question specifically, if you if you want to follow up or or give more information, you can absolutely do that. Yeah. Um, how to measure a pulse laser? Um. So depends on what's measuring. So that's a that's a that's a good question, which has kind of a long answer to it. Um, first off, the question would be what you want to measure. So if we go into power, um, how do I say this? That, that that's a that's a question that I guess requires a little bit more clarification because if it's pulsing very fast or very slow, it may not. In some cases, there wouldn't. It would if it's pulsing very fast. It may be indistinguishable from a continuous laser. Um, I guess that might be a question that might be best handled offline because I guess you know it's probably good to de determine what is measuring, what 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 wants to be measured, and also what the rep rate is um, because pulse lasers. Compared to continuous lasers, sometimes you don't have to change anything, and sometimes you have to change a lot of things. So um, it might be good if you know I could we could discuss that a little bit offline. And and um, and uh, well, that's my yeah. And feel free. I mean, Derek's email is right there on the on the screen, but you can also email us at webinarphotonics.com. Yeah. Uh, and I'll repeat that later. So um, moving on, my next question. Um, can you get a quote good beam from a multi-mode laser? Oh, um, well, uh, that's another one. Depends on your definition of good. Um, so I guess I'll give a story. One time, most laser manufacturers they want their idea of a good beam is m squared of one, and it's single mode, and it's nice and Gaussian. 
Um, but then I've been to laser manufacturers where they got an M squared of 40 and it was very non-Gaussian. And when I, we got an M squared of a very large number, uh, everybody in the room gave a cheer because that was that was what they were looking for because that particular um, that particular type of laser which had a very uh, non-Gaussian beam was exactly what they needed to do the work. So um, you know, good is in the behind you know beauty is in the behind eye of the beholder. Uh, good is in the eye of the beholder. So if you're you know, if if a multi-mode beam does what you has the behavior you want it to do, um, then 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 that's what then that's a good beam. And if you're looking, for example, something to focus very tightly, you would want um, a very Gaussian beam. But on the other hand, if you're say cutting, let's say you're drilling, um, you typically don't want a Gaussian beam. You want a nice flat top beam, which is which is highly multi-mode. So um, you know, so I guess. Maybe the the first thing, if, if you're thinking about, you know, could I get a good beam from a multi-mode laser? Is what's a good beam and and why is it good? So um, I guess that's sort of my discussion, my my answer to that. So. All right, thank you. Um, what is the typical power range of the diffusive imaging far field beam profiling method? Um, yeah, so that typically can look. Um, the diffuser can actually handle a fair amount of power up to about 50 watts. Most most diffusers can handle it with this method. So you're typically down to, you know, 10 millimeter, 10 milliwatts per square centimeter, um, up to even a you know I think five watts per square centimeter. Um, so you you typically can you can typically measure. Um, you know, in, in those types of ranges where where the um, where the where the beam power is in in you know sort of in the milliwatts per square uh, square centimeter range um, at sort of a low end. Actually, you can probably even go lower. To, it, it depends a little bit on on what sort of filters you use and things. So you could actually go lower if you use the technique without filters. Um, but typically. Um, you know, I, th I think typically you can go down to about 10, 10 mil, 10, one, or, one to 10 milliwatts per square centimeter is, is fairly, fairly common. What happens if dust gets into an integrating sphere? Ah, that's a good question. So if dust gets in an integrating sphere, the dust uh, isn't very reflective or very, uh, well, it certainly isn't very reflective. And so what happens is it tends to simply absorb the power and so if you start getting dust or other contaminations in the integrating sphere, it will it will tend to absorb some of the light power and the integrating sphere will measure a little bit lower than the true value of the of the of the input laser. Um, simple way and, and probably the best way to deal with that is simply take an optics blower and you can just uh, you can just you know uh, attempt to blow out the dust and that usually usually can uh, solves it usually solves the trick of, of getting the dust out of the sphere and and, uh, and and prevent that effect. It's also important to, you know, if you're not using the integrating sphere to put a to put a dust cover over it or, or something to keep the dust out because uh, if, if dust accumulates over time, it will it will tend to um, cause the measurements to uh, drift low over time. All right, thank you. I'm going to take a couple more questions for now, but again, feel free to ask as many as you want. We will get back to you. Um, how do you calibrate the magnification of a diffusive imaging far field profiler? Oh, okay. So in order to do that, um, what you do is you can take a ruler and you put it on the, uh, and it's got to be a clear ruler. So um, you can use a clear plastic ruler or you can use, uh, there's some reticles that have um, indentations on them, which indicate this, the, the, the dimensions. And then you can back illuminate that and actually image that onto the profiler. And then you can use the um, you can use the use the, the the marks on the ruler to to determine the uh, the magnification factor. So what what I typically do is I'll just take a clear ruler which has millimeter uh, which indicates the uh, the uh, uh, each each individual millimeter, and then I look I. Image, I, I back illuminate that onto the diffuser and then look at the um, 
measure the dimension. So then look at how uh, how many microns that each millimeter is. Let's see. I look at the size of the millimeter of, of each um, of each um, uh, of each line on the ruler on the profiler, and then I use that to calculate uh, how what the how what the magnification of the image is, and I use that to basically determine the magnification factor. So you typically want to use um, some sort of uh, measuring device that you image with the profiler to actually, uh, you know, directly calculate what the magnification factor is. All right, thank you. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we'll wrap up today's Q and A. Um, how do you beam profile a broad spectrum light source because the CCD camera does not have a flat spectral response? Um, that's a good observation. It doesn't. Um, so um, if you do have a broadband source, uh, the different uh, the, the 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 sensor will respond to the different frequency or the wavelength components differently. And so that is a that is a challenge. Um, if um, if all the different wavelengths tend to have the same beam profile, then that's 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 not really a concern. But yeah, if you wanted to look, if you were had concerns about maybe the red components had a different profile than the green components of your source, um, you would you would lose some of you would lose that information or at least some of that information because the um, the 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 CCD profiler would be responding differently to the different uh, wavelength components. Um, what you can do is you can use filters and filter use say um, like a narrow pass filter to look at the different individual wavelengths individually. Um, that would that would you would you you could you could do it that way and you'd have to kind of reconstruct um, a profile from um, using different uh, filters at different wavelengths to determine the profile at different um, uh, at different wavelengths. So yeah, that's a that's a good point. You you if you if you have a broadband source, um, you do have to think a little bit about how the and you're trying to profile it. You do have to think a little bit about how the um, how the different uh, wavelength components will uh, you know will be imaged by the the profiler. So. All right. Thank you very much, Derek, uh, for taking all of those questions. And you have many more, so um, we're not going to get to those today, but don't worry. Again, uh, we will get back to you. And if you think of another one, uh, absolutely, you can email us or you can email Derek. Uh, the email here is webinar at photonics.com, which is W-E-B-I-N-A-R at photonics.com. And uh, Derek, I'd like to end on a couple of thank you notes. I say a couple, I'm seeing several come in here and, and feel free to keep sending those. I will make sure Derek sees them, but I just wanna read one. Thank you for an informative lecture. You have handled some tough questions with grace. Thank you, I would agree. Thank right. you very much for presenting today. All right. Um, and I've got a couple of reminders. Again, this was recorded. You will be able to access it for free within a couple of days uh, and you won't have to look for that. You will get those links in your email inbox. Um, and if you'd like a copy of today's slides, you can email us and we'll make sure you get that. Uh, and I'd like to thank Derek again, Dr. Derek Peterman, who's sales director for the Americas at Ophir. And I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for participating in measuring the power and beam profile of divergent laser sources. This is again presented by Ophir, part, which is part of MKS Instruments and hosted by Photonics Media. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, well, thank you all.